it's finally here. The latest cult manga from Shohunen Jump finally has an anime adaptation. Jin Saru, the beloved team behind Devilman Cry Baby, has brought Dan Dadan to life with breathtaking animation. Audiences are going to be in for quite a time though when the series shows just how balls to the wall bonkers it is. When it comes to crazy stories, anime has been delivering lately with wild series like Chainsaw Man. But Dan Dadan is something else. A story about a UFO obsessed boy who doesn't believe in ghosts and meets a girl who believes in ghosts, but not aliens. They'll team up for some zany adventures right from the first episode, with plenty of spirits and aliens to keep them on their toes. The first season will cover from the Turbo Granny arc to the Cursed House arc, meaning there's a lot to go through. Just know that the series can get a little mature at times, especially with some of the more raunchy comedy. Momo Ahyase is a typical high school student, though right now she's going through a pretty nasty breakup. Her boyfriend tells her that he's not going to pay for anything like dinner unless she does the deed with him. Screw me. I won't pay it. Leading to a breakup. While Momo isn't too happy with the situation, her friends tell her the guy was a deadbeat anyway, prompting her to give the reason she dated him. Why? Why? What? Turns out, Momo is obsessed with a Japanese celebrity named Ken Takakura, a hard-boiled but awkward character actor. She's attracted to him with a quote about how he's an awkward fellow, after all. Momo's friends are making fun of her for the standards she holds, attracted to someone like the old actor who died a decade ago. Instead, she leaves in a huff, walking around the school to work off her frustration. In a classroom she passes by, a timid boy is sitting at his desk, desperately trying to get schoolwork done as some other boys bully him by throwing paper. Why you bully me? <laughs> Are you bullying me? Everyone asking. He doesn't fight back, but Momo passes by and notices what's happening. Pity on the nerdy boy. When one of the bullies throws a magnet, trying to actually hurt the nerdy kid, Momo steps in, suddenly sitting by him at his desk, giving the bullies a look to get out of there. While the boy thanks her, he's obviously flustered and very shy when talking to the pretty Momo. After a minute of talking, Momo gets up to leave, but he follows her out, saying he knows why she helped him. Momo is interested in ghosts and the supernatural, which the boy knows and he mentions that he's done a lot of research into aliens and UFOs, though he's stunned when Momo tells him that she doesn't believe in aliens, thinking they're all tabloid crap that's made up. She does believe in ghosts though, which the boy fervently says don't exist. At an impasse, Momo and the boy, who she decides to call Okarun, make a deal to prove the existence of their supernatural to the other. We have a deal for you too. Like, subscribe, and ring that bell so we can bring you the best anime content on YouTube. Drop a follow, and we promise we'll keep the videos coming. Fast forward to that night, and both are at the paranormal spot the other one picked. Momo has gone to an abandoned hospital, known for being a UFO hotspot, while Okarun is at a tunnel in Shono City. The tunnel, known for being the home of a yokai named Turbo Granny, it gets weirder, is long and dark. The two soon-to-be friends start a phone call, both entering their paranormal spots at the same time to discover the unknown. Things go downhill faster than the, the promised Neverland Season shit. 2. Momo is only a few steps into the hospital when three identical aliens appear before her. The Serpo, an alien species that takes the form of short men with no neck and long limbs, want her to help their species. Not in a good way though, because they reveal the Serpo are a people of nothing but men, clones of each other that have lost any other way to reproduce. So they take the easy route of stealing human women to give them their banana. Does it sound stupid? Yes, but that's not the last euphemism Dandadan throws at you. Before Momo can tell Okarun what's going on, the Turbo Granny appears in the tunnel spooking him. Okarun stands no chance with the Turbo Granny seeing him and immediately asking to perform another euphemism by gobbling his schlong. Suck. Look, this is only the first episode of the series, it gets crazier. Poor Okarun gets cut off by the Turbo Granny as Momo is taken by the Serpos, who bring her back to their spaceship for experimentation. While she's desperately trying to free herself, they have her locked up on the exam table and are getting ready to do their own version of the face hugger from Alien repopulating their species. Momo looks hopeless until her phone rings with a call from Okarun. The Serpos aren't sure what's going on, but when one answers the call, Turbo Granny comes through the phone. Even worse for the Serpos, she follows up on her request from earlier, biting one of them right where the sun doesn't shine. 
Turbo Granny gets a moment to beat up the Serpos, who are too slow to intercept her with their psychic powers. After a moment though, the truth is revealed that Turbo Granny is controlling Okarun's body. With him affected by her curse, he's not in control of his own actions, until he sees that Momo is in danger, that is, and the simp inside takes over. Okarun, in the middle of saving Momo, explains he's obsessed with aliens because he always felt so alone. He hoped for a UFO to come down and take him one day, desperately begging to be less lonely. Then Momo shows up, acting like a friend and being nice to him. That changed everything for Okarun, who will now do anything to protect her. Things are looking bleak with Momo still tied down and Okarun now getting the crap beaten out of him. Despite the Turbo Granny's power, it's just not enough for the number of Serpos they're fighting. Must be a good time for a Momo flashback. Her parents died when she was young, so she's been raised by her grandmother, a spiritual medium. Every day when Momo was young, her grandma made her perform a special ritual on the way to school, meant to cleanse her aura and keep it healthy. Eventually, when Momo's friends saw her doing it, she got embarrassed and stopped, leading to a falling out with her grandmother. The memory unlocks her aura back on the UFO, blasting her restraints off. Now that she's free, it's time for the two of them to fight back. With her new psychic powers, Momo is able to resist the psychokinesis of the Serpo, flying through the air to send them flying from the UFO. Okarun takes control of the Turbo Granny Curse with help from Momo's new power. Well, maybe not as fast as you liking and subscribing to our channel if you haven't already. Go all out on smashing that like button and share the insanity of Dandadan with others. Unfortunately, they don't get far before Momo's power falters. The Turbo Granny Curse absorbing Okarun once again. He attacks her, desperately pleading with the Turbo Granny not to hurt his friend. Momo takes control of her powers again, pushing the Turbo Granny back. Angry, the curse says that it isn't strong enough this far from her tunnel. Turbo Granny reveals that she's stolen Okarun's clong. Don't question the method. Now, she challenges the two to come back to the tunnel and get it, with a promise to kill them before disappearing with Akarun still cursed. They don't even have time to absorb their new situation, with the UFO crashing down into the hospital behind them. They run for it, finally getting to an old road outside of the city, before they stop to talk. Both agree on the existence of UFOs and spirits, finally but now find themselves faced with so many more problems. If Momo stops using her powers on Okarun, Turbo Granny's curse will take total control. Okarun offers his clothes to Momo so she can cover up, saying he'll be heading home now. Knowing that would be trouble, Momo finally invites him to her home, saying she'll keep an eye on him. I don't like where this is going. While he's far too shy to acknowledge it, he likes Momo, though she doesn't realize it yet. You don't want to be like this. This is disgusting. All Okarun is doing is making up apologies for needing her help, but when she finally tells him to shut up and stop, she gets a surprise. Okarun mentions once more that he's sorry and says that he is an awkward fellow after all. Momo is taken aback by him using the line of her idol Ken Takakura. Say the line! Okarun. I am an awkward fellow after all. Yeah! and is a little shocked by her feelings for Okarun emerging. She realizes that she still doesn't know his real name and asks him right there in the street, only to be even more surprised. Okarun's name is Ken Takakura, just like the man she's in love with, who's dead by the way. That's only the first episode of this arc, as things pick up immediately by telling Okarun that he can't use his real name ever again around her. It's just a little demanding, but he makes an exception as she officially dubs him as Okarun. Together, they head back to Momo's house to get some rest. Except, nothing is ever easy, and Momo's grandmother has paper spirit wards set up on the property line. Okarun tries to go through the front gate of the house, immediately bursting into flames thanks to the Turbo Granny curse. They manage to get back out outside to extinguish the flames, but now there's another issue, how to get inside. Momo takes the easy option, pulling the ward off the main gate so he can get through. Inside, Momo changes clothes, and after she gets changed, she throws some clothes to Okarun, reminding him that he is, in fact, missing his genitals. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Apologizing again, Okarun says that he didn't mean to get her mixed up in danger, but he only wanted a friend to talk to about the paranormal. She waves this away once more, telling him to stop closing himself off. Their heart-to-heart -heart is interrupted by a door chime, though Momo doesn't recognize it. Remembering her grandmother said there's a chime for the living and a chime for evil, they realize something has followed them in. After entering the house, they never put the ward back up, allowing something to slip through. Unfortunately, they're too late to escape 
landscape, with the entire home and surrounding property walled off by huge concrete, a black mist filling the air. Whatever the mist is made of causes Okarun to start bleeding. Desperately, they run to the main gate, finding it blocked by a wall and even worse, a massive creature, the Flatwoods Monster. A cryptid known for being seen in America, Appalachia and parts of Japan is standing there. Uh, he's just standing there. Menacingly! Towering above them in a sumo pose. This is believed to be an alien, but Momo mentions that there's a lot of crossover between the paranormal, so it sets off the evil spirit chime. It says it wants their organs, and with the way blocked, there's no way out. Realizing they have no choice but to fight, Okarun voluntarily taps into the Turbo Granny curse, running Momo away from danger just in time. Setting her down in a safer spot, he starts getting serious, Lee depressed. I have crippling depression. Despite his apathy, he takes off a couple of the Flatwoods monster's blows, fingers, tossing them aside like nothing. His body can't handle the curse though, making him turn back to normal and collapse. Momo finally realizes the creature is trying to fight them in a sumo match, so they have to make its hands touch the ground to win. Okarun turns again despite the pain, blasting a hole through the monster's leg, but it's still not enough. The hand falling to the ground disintegrates, with the creature growing two more feet in its place. Seizing its chance, the monster picks Momo up, slamming her into the wall, blocking the gate. She's knocked out for a moment, stuck there, as the monster turns back to Okarun now in the process of being possessed by Turbo Granny. At the last moment, Momo wakes up and stops the possession, using her powers to create psychic fists to beat the monster. It's not quite enough, causing the creature to beat her further into the wall where she's stuck. In a risky plan, Momo lets the monster smash the concrete wall further back, breaking through the parts inside the gate arch. When it's finally been dug deep enough, she pulls out the spirit ward, sticking it back onto the archway. The Flatwoods monster bursts into flames, banished along with the barrier keeping them there. No longer in danger, Momo faints from her injuries. Unfortunately, that means Turbo Granny is back on the loose, taking over Okarun. With Momo collapsed, Turbo Granny goes for the kill. Across town in Shono City, a late-night talk show is hosting a psychic and a pop idol. While the psychic predicts the idol's age, favorite food, and that he actually is secretly a father, the idol denies all the allegations, with the show laughing the psychic off. <laughs> As she leaves, the show's producers argue if they should cut her segment since she was so hilariously off base with her predictions. <laughs> On a cab back home, the psychic tells the driver to let her out in the middle of nowhere. She suggests if he doesn't leave, he may find an early death. Entering the arch, she finds the turbo granny just in time to save Momo, bashing Okarun's possessed body with a baseball bat. As she complains about Momo bringing home trashy men, she reveals herself, the surprisingly young and in-shape grandmother Momo's been at odds with. Though Turbo Granny puts up a fight, Grandma traps Okarun in a spirit circle, containing him while threatening to murder it despite the fact it would kill Okarun as well. Her reasoning? She'll destroy anyone who tries to seduce Momo. They might be on bad terms, but at least she's protective. Cut to the next morning, Momo wakes up in bed, finding her grandmother downstairs watching television. Worried about Okarun, she starts arguing with her grandmother, who's still mad that Momo called her fake years ago. Come on, you're not an intellectual. You're a fake and a fraud. When Momo finally apologizes, begging to let her know where Okarun is, she relents, revealing he's in the shrine outside. Finally, after a few moments of peace, Momo and Okarun acknowledge they're glad each other is okay. It doesn't last long though, as the Turbo Granny appears from Okarun to tell them she's done waiting and for them to return to the tunnel before she goes on a killing spree. Grandma Siko mentions that fighting Turbo Granny won't be easy as she's a yokai who's become attached to a bound spirit in the tunnel. Turns out, if someone dies and doesn't cross on, they're bound to the spot. This mass of souls means Turbo Granny is even stronger as long as she's near. Grandma gives them both a training regiment, but it's not going to work soon enough for them. As Okarun starts to work out, Grandma goes back into the house to watch television. The pop idol from the late night show is on television now, holding a press conference to offer an apology. 
turns out all of her predictions were right and he's now disgraced thanks to his lies. How dare you! During training, they discover that there are some drawbacks to Momo's ability to keep the curse repressed, namely that she has to physically be looking at Okarun no matter where he may be. Even the bathroom isn't safe and that's when Turbo Granny strikes again. The yokai threatens their lives, saying she can curse anyone to death even from this far away. If they don't show up tonight, she's going to kill them all. They hatch a plan to challenge Turbo Granny to a race, with Grandma giving Okarun some extra protection. Wearing ceremonial clothes along with Momo's powers holding him in check, they arrive at the tunnel. Walking in, they finally get a glimpse of the bound spirit, a massive crab with faces along the shell. Escape is blocked from either side by Turbo Granny's giant head, coming toward them fast with the intent to eat them. Using their last resort plan, they challenge Turbo Granny to a race. The old yokai is immensely proud of herself, making it impossible to turn down the challenge. They give her the stipulation of counting to 10 minutes for a head start and take off, except she's a conniving old hag and counts to 10 minutes like a two-year-old playing hide and seek. What number comes between two and four, Beetlejuice? 25. Within moments, she's on them, knocking Momo down as Okarun goes on the offensive. Even without the curse powers, she's reclaimed for herself. As he bites down on the spirit, Turbo Granny causes the ground to come up and trap him, holding him still. Momo isn't done yet, though. But I'm not done yet! With a new breakthrough in her powers, she's able to pull the Turbo Granny back, shoving the curse power back into Okarun to trap her. With the yokai trapped, the newfound friends believe they've finally won. Wrong! The bound spirit of the tunnel appears, demanding Turbo Granny be given back. It's a massive crab. It begins to chase them, going after Turbo Granny's soul to bring it back to the tunnel. Using the curse powers, they run with the spirit chasing them down. At one point, they believe they're safe, falling into a hot spring resort where Momo uses her powers to dump boiling water on the ghost crab. Despite being turned into a fancy crab dinner by the water, it can still move and chase them. What? Okarun tries getting them away again, but he's exhausted the curse, his body hitting the limit. I can't move it, move it anymore. What is it? Now, with a passed out Okarun, Momo has to figure out a way to get them out alive. What am I gonna do? Turbo Granny forces her way from the exhausted Okarun, monologuing about their death that's soon to come. She merges with the giant crab, ready to demolish them once and for all. As the crab catches up, Momo uses her powers to grab onto a passing subway, believing it would go fast enough to outrun them. Trains never go top speed though. All we had to do was follow the damn train, CJ! And Crab Granny jumps on the train roof a few cars down. While Momo deflects attacks protecting Okarun, she reveals the master plan. Grandma is waiting near the train tracks, right at the boundary where they cross out of Shono City, Turbo Granny's domain. With wards set up along the track, the Turbo Granny disintegrates along with the bound spirit as soon as it crosses, saving Momo and Okarun in the nick of time. As they can finally relax, they look up to see the souls of dozens of young girls finally freed from the bound spirit. Grandma explains that Turbo Granny was known to attach herself to spots where children died, trying to console the spirits. Though she cursed them, she meant well for the souls of these dead girls, all victims of a brutal murderer in that tunnel long ago. Over dinner with Momo and Grandma, Okarun goes back to being his quiet, awkward self. Grandma tries to break him out of it by asking to see if his schlong is back, which isn't really the best way to cheer someone up. It gets him moving though, and he tells Momo now that she doesn't have to control the curse constantly, he's going to go home. They have an awkward goodbye, Okarun believing he's not going to have her as a friend after this. Momo is wondering if she should say something, struck by newfound feeling for the nerdy boy. Hopefully, you'll have some newfound feelings for our channel at this point, or at least enough to hit the subscribe button and share this. Before he can leave, Momo gives him a simple promise. See you tomorrow. The next morning, despite his awkwardness believing she won't want to be seen with him, Momo bumps into Okarun, surprising him. As the two walk to school together, things are looking up, until Okarun goes to the bathroom. He may have gotten his schlong back, but now he's missing the family jewels. To make it worse, he's not able to find Momo at lunch, leading to a huge misunderstanding, until they run smack into each other and accidentally kiss, of course. Awkwardness ensues, with Momo getting upset with him again. Later that day, Okarun is approached by Eira, a popular girl at school. She flirts with him, making him bashful. But as she walks away,
away, passing by Momo in the process. She reveals that she flirts with guys like Okarun as a joke. Not happy with her new friend being the butt of a joke, Momo uses her powers to drop a huge wash basin on Ira's head. Ira was already way off her rocker in the first place, but now she's gone totally insane. Oh, and she has one of Okarun's family jewels, literally disguised as a gold ball that Turbo Granny lost. Believing that Momo is actually a demon come to Earth, she makes a plan with her two friends to kidnap her and purge her of the demon inside. Even more concerning, Aira has been seeing a woman in a red dress hanging out on the school grounds, reminding her of the own mother she lost as a young kid. Okarun tries looking around everywhere for Momo, teaming up with Turbo Granny, who's been sealed inside a small cat doll in one of the outer warehouses for the school by Era and her friends, he's only found the start of their problems. I don't want peace. I want problems, always! The woman in the red dress has arrived, revealing herself to be a yokai called the Acro Silky. Utilizing massive strands of hair to attack and dance around in a frantic ballet, the Acro Silky claims to be Era's mother. Turns out the Acro Silky in her living days was a mother, in absolute love with her young daughter. Trying to survive, she took any job she could, including prostitution, just to keep the roof over their heads. It wasn't enough though, and when she couldn't pay up fast enough on rent, the Yakuza took her daughter as collateral. In despair, she went to the roof of their apartment building, dancing off just like she would dance with with her daughter, teaching her the ballet she was passionate about. Kind of like how we want to teach you about the anime we're passionate about. Now, back to the tragedy of Dandadan. Not long after her death, the ghost was roaming the streets when a young Aira tugged at her dress, asking if she was her mother. Though it wasn't, Aira's mother recently died in an accident. The Akrosilki determined she would be Aira's mother now. Even with Okarun going all out with his curse powers, the Akrosilki is too much to handle. Within moments, the yokai has eaten Aira, Momo, and even Okarun, leaving Turbo Granny in her cat form as the only line of defense left. Despite the fragility of the cat doll, Turbo Granny kicks some ass, being fast enough to run Acro Silky around the warehouse. As her hair winds through, chasing Turbo Granny, the Acro Silky becomes entangled in the beams and rafters of the warehouse. After one more good shot, the kids get coughed up, though things aren't as joyful as they think now that they've won. Aira is dead. Despite being in the yokai's belly alongside Momo and Okarun, she was the only one without Yoink. spiritual power, leading to death. Her aura is now gone. Even Momo can't bring her back by massaging her heart with psychic powers. That's when Acro Silky has a realization that she can't allow Era to die. Giving up her aura, the Acro Silky tears off her own mouth to show she's not dangerous. I won't do it again, so don't be afraid. Allowing her being to disintegrate into Era. Within moments, she's awake, <laughs> thankful to the Acro Silky and promising to always remember her as a mother. Are you going to miss your mom? No. No? <laughs> With all their issues resolved, Momo, Okarun, and Aira head back home to Grandma Seiko, all sitting down for dinner. Not everything goes well though, considering Aira is now determined she's the savior of humanity, destined to destroy Momo. Oh, and she has a major crush on Okarun now, leading to some major contention between her and Momo. Meanwhile, Okarun is just glad to have one of his balls back. Hey, one is better than none, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yes. These poor kids can't catch a break from drama or aliens, especially at the same time. When they go back to school the next day, Okarun mentions to Momo that he won't be able to meet her for lunch for a few days because of work on an essay. Except Momo can tell that he's lying. She just doesn't know why. Liar! When she tries to find him later though, she's surprised to see him behind the school and under Era even. Turns out, Okarun was training behind the school on Seiko's advice, trying to get stronger and surprise Momo. Except Era's obsession with Okarun brought her to him to profess her love, throwing herself at him. That leads to the awkward position Momo finds them in and her resulting anger with Okarun. Despite their fight, they're about to find themselves in even more trouble than before. As Momo is walking around the school, everything outside goes dark and all the other students disappear. They're back in an alien barrier, just like when the Flatwoods monster attacked. Even worse, the entire school has turned into a watery, flooded mess, with the Loch Ness monster roaming the halls. Nessie has come for them, and she's much more dangerous than the grainy photos make her look. Oh my God. Seriously, she shoots laser beams from her mouth, 
While Momo is contending with Scotland's national mascot, Okaroon finds Aira, a floor above where they're attacked by a mantis shrimp man. He really packs a punch, and even the Turbo Granny curse used by Okaroon doesn't hold up against him. It's revealed that the mantis shrimp is actually a gig worker hired by the Serpoyans, meant to help steal Okaroon's Yoink. banana organ. A protracted battle ends up awakening new powers in Ara as well, using the Acro Silky's aura to now transform just like Okaroon. Combined power from the two of them takes Mantis Shrimp down in next to no time. But the Serpoyans aren't going to let their money go to waste that quickly. Using one of their technologies, a Serpo stabs the Mantis Shrimp, making him evolve into an even more deadly form. Okaroon and Ara are no match, taken down quickly as they try to get away from the danger. They're sent crashing down to the floor below when an attack breaks the floor, spilling them down to where Momo is still trying to run from Nessie. The three try to make a plan to escape. Though their powers are all relatively useless against the combined forces, Okaroon isn't able to swim in his curse form, leaving Momo to use her powers to propel them forward. Meanwhile, Era is still getting used to her powers, unable to get a good handle on her strength. Nessie comes in as a wild card, going ballistic to attack indiscriminately with laser breath that would make Godzilla jealous. Serpo finally has enough, telling Mantis Shrimp he's useless and Nessie she's too unpredictable. They use their technology to merge together. An unholy combination of Mantis Serpo Nessie is coming after them now, threatening to take them in for further experimentation. As Momo, Okarun, and Aira all end up without clothes on for some reason or another, Eventually, they're able to all team up to put a finishing blow against the Serpo monster. Returning them to reality, the barrier fades, the Serpo run, and their classmates suddenly reappear. Except the one thing that doesn't reappear, their clothes. Even worse, Momo landed right on top of Okaroon outside a classroom window, leading everyone to get one hell of a view. All three are quickly taken to the principal, where they're interrogated as to if they're being bullied. Even though they all deny it, the principal doesn't believe it at all. When they're finally alone, Okarun tells them the theory he has and why he thinks the aliens are after them specifically. He believes that since aliens haven't been able to totally invade Earth yet, there's a reason they're afraid to make a move. That reason is the supernatural around the world, from yokai to cryptids and ghosts. These are the only weaknesses the aliens have, with spiritual power being stronger than the technology they possess. Despite the terror and destructive force they hold, the yokai are the only thing keeping the Earth safe. They're all taken aback when a familiar face shows up though, Mantis Shrimp. He challenges them again, determined to fight for his son back on his home planet. His wounds are too much though, leading to passing out right in front of them. When he awakens, he finds his wounds bandaged and food left out for him. Then and there, he promises to never try to hurt them again, explaining his story. <laughs> His son has a disease, causing him to lose large amounts of blood constantly. To afford his transfusions, Mantis Shrimp takes on jobs as an outlaw, despite his weaker strength compared to the rest of his species. That's fucked up, man. Now that he's out the money from the Serpo, he has to find another way to afford his son's treat. Seiko figures out the secret, though, catching the smell of Shrimp's bandages as they're treating him. <laughs> what a nut! The species has milk for blood, surviving off of the substance. It's an insane realization, but they help him out by giving him a cow to take, leading to a super stereotypical scene of a cow being sucked into a UFO as he leaves. With everything settled from the battle, everyone goes home to finally catch a break, eating a ton of food as they do. Naturally, there has to be a cliffhanger for the next season to leave off on, both door chimes ringing at the same time. Unsure what to think, they open the door to find a young man, Gigi, who is Momo's childhood friend. He's having some supernatural issues. Can I tell you a secret? Sure, man. I see dead people. But will his arrival throw off the growing romance between Momo and Okaroon? It's only the beginning of their journey, and the battle between yokai and aliens is about to get intense. With Earth stuck in the middle, Dandadan is just starting to take the world by storm. And if you like and subscribe now, we'll make sure you see it all. Now, Dandadan has already hit pretty hard with everything from the Loch Ness monster to aliens. Time to top those though, but this time with angry monkeys, zombie soda cans, and Mongolian deathworms? Huh? 
Okarun and Momo end up way in over their head when trying to help an old friend, and Okarun may end up with some jealousy issues. In a one-off story arc, Momo and Okarun are on the way to school when an alien baboon that sounds like the worst frat boy ever attacks. Mm, monkey. He's hitting baseballs at them. The baboon has a massive soda can receiver at the top of the school, situated right on the corner of the roof. It's turning people into massive walking cans that can instantly turn others as soon as they make physical contact. Okarun learns the hard way, going in for an attack hoping to destroy the receiver. He makes contact, but becomes one of the walking tin zombies instead. Momo is chased through the school by the baboon, soda cans mobbing outside as he lobs explosive baseballs at them with home run level hits. Despite Momo's attempts at blocking the hits, she still takes some damage, running herself into one of the corner rooms. After a barrage of explosives from Baboon Boy, Momo reveals her master plan. Use the explosions to knock out the structural supports under the receiver can. The roof comes tumbling down, bringing the can and baboon along with it, knocking them out cold. With everything returning to reality from empty space, the school and tin zombies are restored to their normal selves. While nobody quite knows why they're roaming the school grounds, they return to business as usual, Okarun and Momo doing the same. It's only the beginning of the weird crap they're about to deal with in this season. After the Serpo arc, with the growing team of Momo, Okarun, Ira, Siko, and Turbo Granny, there doesn't seem to be much room left. Despite that, they have another member of the team now, Mr. Mantis Shrimp, who has revealed his name in human language as Peewee. Yeah, they aren't going to call him that. When the group is enjoying their customary after battle feast, the doorbell rings, revealing Momo's old childhood friend Gigi. He's been sent to live with Seiko after his parents were in an accident, but there's something else going on that he isn't telling them. Even worse, whatever it is has followed him to Momo's house, with a tall figure wearing nothing but underwear and a terrifying smushy smile on his face. <laughs> In the meantime, Okarun gets a sign of one of his missing balls when an anatomical model leaps over them one night as they're heading home. It's an escapee from the school, able to break itself apart into different labeled organs and areas at will. They go on the run after it, finding that it goes to a trash heap running all the way from the school every night. The reason? To see another anatomical mannequin that's been thrown away. Turns out, both are living beings, and they're in love, damn it. Look, we're not asking for this kind of love, but if you haven't liked and subscribed, we would still love you a whole lot. We have new anime content coming out every day, so hit the bell to keep up. Seiko makes them a promise when it's revealed, saying she'll take in the mannequin, Hina and Taro, the running mannequin can visit every night. In return, he just has to give Okarun's ball back. Small problem, he doesn't have it. Turns out the glowing thing they saw wasn't Okarun's ball, but just a bright jewel hanging on his crotch. Yeah, it's not really a win for them. They're touched by Taro's dedication and love though, bringing him into the family. After a couple of days, Gigi tells them about the figure, and the real reason he's here is revealed. The house his family recently moved into is cursed, with both of his parents trying to hang themselves from the balcony just days before. They request help from Seiko, knowing that she's familiar with spiritual evils, but she says she'll be powerless in the prefecture the home is in. Instead, she sends Momo and Okarun along with Gigi to perform an exorcism, kicking off the cursed house arc. Gigi's home is located right next to the base of a volcano, surrounded by hot springs in the small village. While Momo goes out to one of the nearby hot springs, for a bath, Okarun and Gigi hang around the house investigating for any kind of supernatural issues. To Okarun's surprise, he and Gigi get along very well. You're my friends now. We're having soft tacos later. Leading to becoming friends and even more conflicting jealousy for Okarun over Momo's affections. Unfortunately, things are about to get weird again though, with a whole group of strange people standing in the trees nearby watching every move in the house. Momo is in for a bad time, even after having a nice soak in the hot springs. Got a bad feeling about this. Right as she's planning to leave, a crowd of men come in, naked as the day they were born, and hop into the bath with her. She didn't realize thanks to how run down the place is, but the sign on the door says, this is a mixed bathing hot spring. Not wanting the men to get a look at her, Momo sits low in the water, trying to guard herself. Too bad the guys get even creepier in no time flat. They start harassing Momo, attempting to grab her under the water and feel her up. Despite using her powers to repel them, it's a losing battle. Thankfully, after a little bit of destruction, Momo knocks down the outer wall of the baths, making it fall over like an old movie gag with her square in the doorway. 
she's the only one unharmed as all the naked men are stuck under the heavy lumber. Though Turbo Granny emerges from the bath nearby, shaking herself off, turns out the cat doll she's in is a good luck charm and some of that luck is still there. Unfortunately, the recipient of the luck is totally random, so it can apply to anyone. After her ordeal at the hot spring, Momo decides to follow her grandma's advice and visit a shrine to the local god, a snake monster named Tsuchinoku. Supposedly, it was a great serpent long ago, and every year, there would be a sacrifice made to him to ensure the volcano nearby didn't erupt. Unfortunately, there's only a little piece of dried snake skin at the shrine, with the priest there more concerned about becoming a big-time influencer. His big plan for fame? Headstands. Lots of headstands. Back at the cursed house, Okarun and Gigi are making a startling discovery of their own. When something hits a wall inside, they realize it sounds hollow. What's more, they realize that the house is smaller on the inside than on the outside, leading to them tearing through the newfound hollow wall. Inside, there's an empty room, nothing but ceiling talismans papered all around the walls, floor, ceiling, and any empty space possible. Now that it's been opened though, something may have been let out. Oh my god! What is that? Their discovery is quickly derailed when there's a knock at the door. While Gigi answers, Okarun grabs a poster to cover the hole in the wall, desperately hiding it from any visitors. At the door though, are the same people that were watching from the woods. Turns out they're the owners of the house. Everyone files inside, making themselves at home to Gigi and Okarun's expense while telling them how fortunate they are to still live there. Now that the Kito family has arrived, things get much darker, with an aura of threatening evil over the entire place. Despite their grilling, Okarun answers the questions to make them see he's Gigi's friend and not just another spirit medium. Apparently, Gigi's family had called in no less than three spirit mediums before Seiko, with all of them turning up dead. After catching Okarun and Gigi in a lie about Momo being there, things become grim. I don't like where this is going. They beat the living crap out of the boys as Momo makes her way back home, finding them unconscious by the time she arrives. The Kito family reveals they've been making yearly sacrifices to the Tsuchinoku to keep the volcano at bay. Using the house as an altar, they've sacrificed people for centuries, and now it's come to their turn. With the two boys tied up as sacrifices, the Kito family throws Momo into the secret room dampening her powers Yoink. along with Turbo Granny. The situation gets more weird as Momo starts to sink into the ground. Then the big reveal. There are dozens of houses sunken under this one, each one used at some point in the ritual sacrifice. With Momo now trapped, things look hopeless until Okarun and Gigi wake up, getting a hit in on the Kito family to knock them down into the pit as well. Now, they've really hit the pits. If you hated that pun, like and subscribe so we stop making them. On to the giant worm. Dandadan becomes Duna Dadan with the reveal of Tsuchinoku in the flesh. The huge worm is just making its way through the land around them, giant maw eating through the ground, and even some of the Kito family. Everyone is trapped in the pit now, with Okarun and Gigi falling in after a hit from the worm. Down in the pit, Gigi starts to see the spirit again, except now he gets the full story. The spirit is an amalgamation of everyone sacrificed by the Kito family, all starting from the original child. Back in the early days, this poor kid was locked away, with no food, no friends, with only bars over his window. Cruel doesn't begin to cut it, as the local kids would play right next to his barred windows, sneering at him while they refused to help. All the poor child wanted to do was play and be a kid, but he's soon fed to the giant worm, becoming the first sacrifice. Over the years, this child's loneliness and desire to be a normal living child overcame him. It merged with the hate and fear of later sacrifices, eventually taking the form Gigi sees now, begging him to play. Let's play football. As the rest are knocked out, the spirit opens up a massive third eye in its forehead. Turbo Granny warns him that the spirit is an evil eye, with anyone making eye contact damned to be possessed by it. Gigi doesn't listen, telling the evil eye he'll play with it as much as it wants. Now Okarun, Momo, and Turbo Granny face a triple threat from the Kito family, Worm, and the now-possessed Gigi. The evil eye wants nothing more than to destroy every human it comes across, full of vile hatred for everyone. Can't really blame him after all those years, to be honest. Thanks to the worm's movements, a lot of the houses in the pit start collapsing inward. Not that that's a problem for Evil Eye. He and the worm have a scuffle for a moment, but end up leaving each other alone to slaughter everyone else instead. 
Despite Okarun's best efforts, Evil Eye is much stronger than him, and he's knocked out again briefly while Evil Eye goes on another rampage. Momo has to hide, and the worm is starting another strategy to take out the food without worrying about the Evil Eye. Hiding in the pit wall, it begins spraying mucus out that sticks to everything. Evil Eye is going on the offensive and trying to find Momo now, and they have an idea to get Momo out, using Okarun's curse powers, strength, and Momo's powers to launch her like a rocket through the pit opening. At this point, the Evil Eye has set everything on fire, which is battling for control of the area with the worm's mucus splashing everywhere. They pull off their plan, Momo barely making it to the surface with the help of her powers, but now she has to figure out how to get the others out. Making a rope out of every sheet in the house seems like a good idea, except it barely gets into the pit, much less far enough for the others to reach. Time for another plan. Meanwhile, in the pit, Gigi's body has been hurt by a poison in the worm's mucus, now everywhere, along with the fire. Evil Eye, realizing he needs to end things fast, beats Okarun down into the oldest house of the pit, where his decaying original body is still sitting. Then he gets caught up in villain monologuing, telling Okarun he plans to torture Momo after defeating him. Yeah, Okarun doesn't like that at all. He beats the living crap out of the evil eye, going faster than he ever has from the anger he feels. All he wants to do is protect Momo and his new friend Gigi at this point, and he puts all that frustration into every punch he throws. Before long, he knocks Gigi out, taking the W in a fight all by himself. Concerned for his friend, Okarun pulls the evil eye to a safer spot before hearing Turbo Granny's voice from even further down in the pit. She's trapped in the mucus, unable to move. Of course, when Okarun tries to help her, he gets stuck too, because why wouldn't he? Oh man, I'm stuck. These kids can never catch a break. <laughs> I'm in danger. On the surface, Momo figures out another plan, calling in the fire department. Despite their disbelief at first, they eventually start soaking the ground around the home, noticing smoke rising from the house. Momo remembers what the priest told her about the Tsuchinoku, that it stayed in the dirt to hide from the light but couldn't breathe if there was water. Her theory was right, and the worm bursts from the ground, immediately starting to burn in the bright sun. Oh wait, things go wrong again. The worm hides behind the house as the sun is going down, using the shade to save itself. Momo has finally had enough of the crap though, using her powers to knock down the entire house in one huge swing. Now with nothing to hide behind, the worm drying out fast in the setting sun. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. With everything wrapped up and peaceful, Momo goes to check and make sure the worm is dead, when suddenly it pukes up the surviving Kito family members, somehow still alive. The matriarch of the family starts scolding her for killing the worm, warning her that bad things are going to happen to the town now. She's right. The volcano starts to erupt, spewing lava down toward the small hot spring town. There's nothing that can stop it, and everyone is told they need to evacuate immediately. Centuries of dormant peace are instantly ended with magma rapidly descending on Momo with Gigi, Turbo Granny, and Okarun still trapped in the pit. Quick thinking helps Momo come to a realization that she can use the worm's body to fight the magma, picking it up with her powers. She realizes the worm's body can act like a water pump with her powers, holding one end in the hot spring and pointing the other at the rapidly approaching magma. It works. But after only a few minutes, Momo's energy is running out. She's losing her powers from overuse and it looks like she won't be able to save anyone. But wait! Things still get worse. The Kito family attacks her, angry that she's disrespecting Suchinoku's body to put out the fire. When they start attacking, the evil eye flies up from the pit, back into attack mode and taunting Momo about Okarun. He won't say where he is, will not tell you. but heavily implies that he's died in the fires below. As the evil eye attacks, the priest from the Suchinoku shrine arrives, defending Momo from the spirit. The idiot was Seiko's apprentice this whole time, but was too stupid to realize Momo was the person Seiko asked him to look after. Are you fucking dumb? The fire is raging on, Okarun is still missing, the evil eye is bent on killing her, and the Kito family is on the same page as him. Momo and Manjiro, the priest, are vastly outnumbered, and she's barely hanging on while trying to put the fires out. The heroes have finally met their match surrounded by danger, until help arrives in the form of Miss Seiko, being lowered down on top of Taro by the tractor beam of a UFO. She's arrived to kick ass, and nobody is going to be safe from her wrath. Mr. The shrimp uses the UFO beam to pick up the worm's front end and aim it at the lava. With their help, 
they're able to rapidly put out the fire. It's not much of a break though, because they still have to rescue Okarun and Turbo Granny from the pit, filled with fire itself. Meanwhile, Evil Eye is still after them, though Siko is taking care of that. She blasts Taro toward the Evil Eye, though he bats the mannequin aside easily. That's part of the trick though, as he pulls back together, trapping Gigi inside the hollow mannequin shell that's filled with warding talismans. They've successfully captured the Evil Eye, keeping it at bay. For now at least, as Siko reveals that the talismans will only work for a short time before Evil Eye becomes numb to them. Until then, they have to figure out a plan, hopefully, one that can fully keep Evil Eye at bay. In the meantime though, they're able to suppress him enough to get Gigi back. There's another item off the list with one less thing to worry about. You can have one less thing to worry about too, if you like and subscribe to our channel. Ring the bell for more anime content with theories and recaps for some of the best new anime every week. Momo stands at the pit edge wondering if she was too late. Shrimp uses the beam on the ship to try pulling them up, with a giant ball of hardened worm mucus ascending to the surface. When they finally drop it to the ground, everyone expects the worst, but they crack it open to find out Okarun's fate. There, in the middle of the giant hollow shell of gross, sticky phlegm, Okarun and Turbo Granny are cowered in tight to each other, possibly thanks to her lucky charms. Lucky! The mucus encased them, saving them from the flaming death below. They knock the Kito family back into the hole though. The only one left is the matriarch though, everyone else murdered by the evil eye. As she slinks off into the pit, she sheds her human skin, revealing that she's actually a subterranean alien. That's a cliffhanger for another time though. As everyone heads back home for the customary feast after a battle, the next day, they pay Gigi's parents a visit who will soon be released from the hospital. In the meantime though, they'll need to figure out how to get rid of the evil eye. During dinner, the next night, they find out just how over their heads they are. Seiko says they need a special band of musicians for the exorcism, and they won't be available for a few days. In the meantime though, a splash of cold soy sauce from dinner lands on Gigi's hand, making the evil eye go berserk and destroy the house. Okarun tries to hold it off desperately, though nothing works against his overwhelming power. Evil Eye is ready to kill everyone when he's hit by a splash of boiling water, turning him back to Gigi. Now with a temporary solution to make sure he doesn't go berserk again, everyone carries a hot water thermos to protect themselves. The Evil Eye is next up on the problem list, but he definitely won't be the last. In the next season of Dan Da Dan, our heroes will have to fight off an entire alien invasion. Things are only going to get more crazy and this series is constantly one-upping itself. Make sure to like and subscribe for the next level of Dan Da Dan insanity. There might even be a new kaiju in town that would put kaiju number 8 on notice. The adventures of Okarun and Momo just keep getting more insane as Dan Da Dan goes on. Even after facing down a Mongolian death worm and subterranean aliens, the duo has their work cut out for them when they face down the evil eye curse and a kaiju? Plus, the first big overlapping arc of Dandadan begins with the introduction of a mysterious new villain, putting Earth on the edge of intergalactic war. Despite the damage to the house, everyone decides to sleep over. That way, they can keep an eye out just in case. Okarun promises that he's going to keep an eye on Gigi, even waking up to take him Yoink. to the bathroom. During all of this, Momo takes on a part-time job, though she's really not keen to tell anyone about it. Her friends in homeroom find out though, and when she tells Okarun she can't hang out that night, they invite him along to visit her at work. Turns out, she's working at a maid cafe, complete with all the weird things that come with it. Momo has to attend to people's every need, while at the maid cafe, and that includes making tea, serving food, and just being perved on by weird people in general. It's not pleasant, but she gets by so she can save up money for a cell phone. When Okarun shows up with her friends, it's a major toss-up as to which one of them is more embarrassed to see the other. Momo's friends put her through the ringer of awkwardness still, ordering tea and generally just being obnoxious to her in front of Okaru. She has to make the tea every time by doing a special chant and making a heart over the tea, sending out love beams into it. Yes, it's weird, but it will be important later. You sure about that? When her friends finally go to leave, Okarun says he'll stay to walk Momo home. She's not having it though insisting that he go back home and be with Gigi, who's skipping school until they can actually figure out the whole evil eye thing. Despite his finally conceding to leave, Okarun returns at 10 when Momo gets off work so he can walk her home safely. The next day brings more trouble for Okarun, still caught between Momo, who he loves, and Aira, who is for some reason super obsessed with him. 
It should have been me, not him! Oh, and Okarun is getting deep in his feelings because he thinks Momo and Gigi are going to fall in love. Oh, hey! It's rough being a teenager in a shonen manga, but at least he doesn't have things as bad as Yuji Itadori, I guess. When Era comes in, holding a drink, only to end up tripping on Gigi, it leads to disaster. This time, the evil eye appears, but instead of immediately trying to destroy everything, he traps Momo in a force field with him before anyone can reach for their hot water threatening to kill her. Man, I'm dead. His reason, he wants to destroy the entire world in revenge for what was done to him, turning him into the evil eye. Everyone is tense, not making a move in fear for Momo's life. Just as things look their grimmest, Momo spits water out right in evil eye's face, turning him back. Everything is back to normal. The band arrives and it's time for a good old-fashioned exorcism. Except, Gigi finds out that getting the exorcism will kill the evil eye, and he doesn't want it to happen. According to him, the evil I just wants someone to play with because he's lonely and Gigi doesn't want to end his life after he's been through so much pain. Finally, Okarun stands up to take control, telling Gigi to let the evil eye out. They both transform. Gigi and Okarun going at it with evil eye intending to kill him at every point. Even still, Okarun manages to get the win over the yokai, defeating it and pinning it down with the band ready to start playing at any moment. He gives an ultimatum. He'll play with the evil eye every Tuesday afternoon, going all out in a fight to keep the spirit entertained. This is going to play in a lot later, especially in a few arcs because evil eye expects Okarun to keep the appointment. He even gives the awkward kid his underwear as a promise, telling him to hold on to them until evil eye kills them. A true gentleman's agreement. I'll make that deal. How about you, you bitch? You make that deal? I make that deal. I don't blame you. Damn good deal. Everyone goes back home as Seiko, Momo, and Turbo Granny grab a hotel. With the evil eye finally under control, they can resume their search for Okarun's other missing ball. They'll get a clue to where it is, but not before we get to meet a couple of new, interesting characters. At school the next day, Momo and Okarun are walking in when a girl tells Okarun he doesn't have to let her boss him around all the time. Apparently, she's been holding this in for a while because it's monologue central while she gets ready to say her piece. Turns out, she's the class president, Rin, and she's got quite the crush on Okarun. That's secondary though, because this chapter introduces us to the one and only only Reese God, Kinta. This little dude is weird and looks like a thumb dressed as Kim Jong Un. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. Yet, he believes that he's the hottest thing on earth and confidence is key. He's also just a pathetic loser on the inside, but that comes later. Kinta demands Okarun to tell him how he manages to get so many hot girls to hang out with him, which really surprises Okarun because being friends with everyone at this point is because of a series of very unfortunate wacky events. He just tells Kinta he's got nothing, making the absolute idiot suspicious that he just doesn't want to share his secrets. Are you hiding something, Okarun? Everyone goes back to Momo's house after school, intending to start work on fixing the house, only to find that their old friend Peeny Weenie, the mantis shrimp, has beat them to the punch. He's brought in an alien named Ludris, famous throughout the cosmos, who gives them a special material called nanoskin. This can become anything the user imagines, and all they have to do is picture the house as they mold a giant block into an exact replica. Ludris, who nobody can understand, takes off not long after that, kind of pissed off that they didn't take him seriously. They're able to completely rebuild the house, making it as good as new. A great success! Of course, there's more trouble to come. The next day, Momo hears a rumor about an apartment complex not too far away, said to be haunted by a solitary floating ball. Momo rushes in to get Okarun, despite Rin now telling her she's banned from entering their classroom. They take off toward the apartments after she tells him about his ball being sighted, leaving green angry. The two ghost hunters go into the apartments to search and end up finding what they're after. The floating gold ball is right in front of them and Momo gets a hand on it. Okarun gets knocked back and whatever it is pulls Momo a long way as she hangs on. They're about to be in big trouble when Okarun realizes that the ball is being used by something else camouflage to blend into their surroundings. He goes all out, giving it a good hit and knocking it over the apartment complex balcony as they realize they've entered empty space again. Then they look down to see a freaking kaiju in the middle of a crater where it fell. This thing looks like Godzilla 
Godzilla, ready to fight them to the end, and it does, taking on Momo and Okarun both as they desperately try to survive. Kinta is still there, caught in all the madness as they flee back to Momo's house, unsure of what to do against an enemy this stupidly big, and the kaiju on their tail. Despite Okarun's best efforts to keep it at bay, they still can't get the battle under control. Until Okarun has the genius idea of using the nano skin, he finds out there's a whole house worth of it. They decide to form a giant weapon out of the house, except Okarun, Aira, and Momo each try and almost kill themselves in the process. Meanwhile, the kaiju is still coming after them, and it seems super angry now. Oh no! Finally, Kinta takes control, molding the house into the image of a giant freaking mech suit modeled on a Buddha statue. Everyone gets shuttled off into a different limb, like Power Rangers in a Megazord. Each controlling their own arm or leg. That doesn't go over well as expected, because nobody knows how to coordinate in this group unless things are at their darkest. This is fine. As they try to fight the kaiju, everyone except Kinta gets thrown from the mech house with only him left in charge of a very beaten up machine. The man absolutely perseveres though, fighting through everything and holding the kaiju off while everyone else recovers. Unfortunately, he's bested by a surprise attack. The kaiju uses a laser breath attack. Things aren't looking good for the group and the house is getting wrecked again. Finally, after Momo and Okarun recover, with Kinta being beaten down to the dirt now, they form a plan. Aira and Kinta will restrain the kaiju while Okarun and Momo lead up to take the golden ball. They'll have to go fast though, because the monster is getting even more angry as the battle continues. Kinta grabs onto the monster, holding it in a lock before jumping high into the air, bringing it down in a power bomb worthy of fame. And the creature shrinks back down to size, revealing that you should like this video and subscribe for new anime content daily. Actually, they find out it's a suit, and there's a young girl with antenna inside. Okarun is standing above her when she wakes up, and she immediately kisses him. According to her, she's going to marry Okarun now, much to Aira and Momo's surprised reactions. Momo isn't very happy about that kiss either, so she and Okarun are back to square one after reconciling only days ago. The guy can't catch a break. Of course, Kinta is flabbergasted, unable to conceive of why she wouldn't marry him instead. Then they find out that the girl doesn't know how to speak their language. All she can do is repeat what everyone else says, with nobody understanding a thing. What did he say? An intergalactic language barrier. Meanwhile, they realize that the gold ball powering the suit isn't actually Okarun's ball, unfortunately. Instead, it's just some alien power source from the girl's home planet, made to power the huge kaiju suit. After taking their home back where it's supposed to go and bringing the girl along with them, they contact good old Peenie Weenie to see if he can translate what the girl is saying. He and Chiquitita giving them a pair of gag glasses with a mustache on them. This is the translator, but unfortunately, it's pretty out of date and they can't understand her. They are able to ask her name though and learn she's called Vamola. Of course, with nowhere else to go, she becomes one of the stray kids that Seiko takes in. Vamola ends up taking to the others pretty quickly, though Momo is still very apprehensive of how attached she is to Okarun. Even still, Momo offers to walk her to school the next day, putting the two of them in a whole heap of danger. They discover that Vamala can shrink the kaiju suit down to disguise it as a hoodie, which really helps when they start taking her to school. Now Vamala and Momo are on their way, but realize they're going to be late if they don't hurry up. Completely disregarding advice her grandmother gave her years ago, Momo has Vamola repeat a ritual before they take a shortcut through an abandoned industrial park that's supposedly haunted. Big mistake! They run into Reiko Kashima, a famous yokai around Japan better known as the Teke Teke. But for Dandadan purposes, she's turned into the slit-mouthed woman. She's hideous but determined she's incredibly beautiful. Her vanity leaves her constantly gazing into a mirror, complimenting her own beauty as she kills any that dare tell her otherwise. Momo remembers her grandmother saying that the word pomade, when chanted ten times, will vanquish the evil spirit, but has a lot of trouble actually getting the words out. Despite Vamola's attempt to help in the mech suit, 
she instead gets suplexed. Defeated, she's captured inside Reiko Kashima's mirror. Now, Vamola is left staring out from a mirror dimension, only able to watch Kashima as she preens herself. Even as Momo tries to use the pomade chant again, Kashima takes her out with a punch from a mirror shard on the ground, revealing she can control any reflections. Unable to complete the ritual, Momo is instead captured and sent into the mirror alongside Vamola, both trapped at the yokai's mercy now. Things are bleak, but Momo has an idea that Vamola can easily help her with. Vamola lets down the mask on the kaiju suit, revealing her face as she and Momo make cute faces in the mirror. This blocks Reiko Kashima from seeing her own reflection, causing a massive outburst of anger that leads to letting the girls out of the mirror dimension. Now free, Momo completes the pomade chant, getting rid of the old hag before she can cause any more harm. Little do they know that Momo has only made herself a new target of something she can't hope to ever defeat. When everyone gets back home that night, Seiko hears the story of Reiko Kashima and their deadly run-in. Needless to say, Momo did the stupidest thing possible in her attempt at getting away from the evil spirit and has only made her situation much worse. The pomade chant that she used doesn't permanently vanquish a spirit, instead only getting rid of them temporarily while requiring an even more rigorous chant the next time they're encountered. Now, Momo is going to be haunted by Kashima every night for a week as the ghost tries to get her revenge. Seiko gives Momo an ultimatum to be home by 10 every night for the next week locking her in her room alongside Vamola so that she can't get out. Even with everyone around to protect them, Momo is scared and worried. Understandable too, since Kashima is able to imitate the voices of those Momo loves in order to try and trick her outside. It almost works too, when Momo starts to hear Okarun outside her window, promising to stand out there and protect her from Kashima through the night. Despite her initial belief that it really is Okarun, and her actual hope that he really is confessing her love, Momo wises up to the yokai's scheme. She tells Kashima that she doesn't know Okarun at all when she calls her Momo instead of Miss Ayase like normal, enraging the spirit for the rest of the night. Momo is unable to sleep and the sounds of Kashima's screaming and cursing keep her up all night. Despite the chaos, she never relents, though she doesn't sleep at all that night. Poor Momo is only facing the beginning of her troubles though, as she has to work at the maid cafe that night and doesn't get off until 10. Will she be able to make it home in time to avoid Reiko Kashima all week? Even worse, things are about to go to hell in a handbasket for the entire Dandadan squad, leaving everyone in a state of disrepair at one of the worst possible times. Momo goes to work unable to leave when suddenly we get a flashover to an old foe who's running into their own trouble. At the hospital from the beginning of the series, still run down and dilapidated, the Serpo are confronting a trespasser. They're no match though, as massive aliens are after Okarun's ball that they believe the Serpo still have. They get beaten down, the aliens leaving once they realize what they want isn't there and move on to find the source of the balls, Okarun himself. Everyone is in for the fight of their lives, and even a little confession of love before all is said and done. The next season of Dandadan will see the greatest danger they've ever met, and tensions are going to run high before things end up getting better. For more Dandadan, or for some of the latest theories on series like Jujutsu Kaisen or Chainsaw Man, be sure to like, follow, and ring the bell to get updates. Otherwise, the aliens might go for you too. With Momo still under the curse of Reiko Kashima, things can't get any worse, right? Yeah, these kids don't have this that kind of luck, unfortunately. After school that day, it's time for Momo to go to work in the maid cafe again, though she's desperately begging her boss to let her leave before 10 p.m. She's one of the most popular maids at the cafe, though, so that's not happening. Of course, they don't have a lot of say in the decision before long because everything is about to go straight to hell for the entire gang. Okarun is on his way back to Seiko's house with a promise to return and pick Momo up later that night, desperate to keep her safe. Little do they know that Okarun is the one who's about to be in real trouble. Meanwhile, across town, Gigi and Aira are heading home their own way when two massive aliens appear, plunging them into empty space for an all-out assault. They're powerful too, with Aira's acro-silky powers barely able to touch them. Even though Gigi is learning to control the evil eye's powers on his own, it's still nowhere near enough to do any real damage. These aliens are strong, stronger than any others they've faced, and in a desperate attempt to get away, Aira splashes Gigi to unleash the evil eye. 
Once he's awake, it looks like the tide of battle has turned, except he's intent on keeping his promise to Okarun vowing not to fight anyone but him, even as he gets the living crap beaten out of him by the aliens who show exactly how powerful they are by nearly obliterating him. Ira is too injured to fight, and the evil eye has been totally knocked out along with Gigi. Seeing that things aren't going their way, she makes a barrier with the Acro Silky's hair, covering both her and Gigi from danger. The aliens don't appreciate that at all, going on a rampage to attack and blowing up most of the city in empty space. They reveal that the massive forms they're in are just suits, and their real, octopus-like forms are too weak to handle the Earth's gravity for extended periods of time. As the aliens blast away the dome of hair Ira was using to protect them, they discover that their prey has escaped into the sewers below. The aliens leave to report back to their leader, noting that their plans still need more power to function. Their friends are about to find the power they need, though. Okarun is walking along the empty stretch of road, almost to Seiko's house, when empty space takes over and a whole crowd of aliens appear right in front of him. Each one is terrifyingly powerful, and despite turning into the Turbo Granny curse and going all out, Okarun gets beaten down hard. He makes the best effort he can, but not before they extract his ball, the one he only just got back a few days Days before from era. Help arrives just in time. Mr. Mantis Shrimp appears, transforming into his true form to bring one hell of a fight to the aliens. Even though he's geared up for a fight though, the aliens disappear, saying their time is limited but they'll be back. Now that they have the gold ball, it looks like it's only a matter of time before things get crazy. Speaking of crazy, it's pretty crazy that you've watched all this without liking the video. Yeah, we can see you. Make sure to like and subscribe before the curses come for you too. Momo is back at work, serving tea and hustling to try and get through her shift before 10, unaware of the hell her friends are currently facing across town. She's about to become aware of a lot more problems of her own though as an old enemy shows up knocking at the door of the cafe. A Serpo is standing right outside requesting Momo's help to take down a common enemy. His face is scarred now. Momo is ready to fight him when empty space takes over the cafe, turning the cafe patrons into a corrupted version of the Serpo with the creepiest face possible. As they attack, spreading the corruption around, Momo and Serpo are forced to team up and attack. For everyone that they smash around, the corrupted turn back into regular Serpo, joining them in the fight. Despite the overwhelming odds, they turn the tides of battle before realizing there's another presence pulling the strings. Of course, no alien can do anything without oh a monologue, and this thing spills some major beans. Vamela was a scout for them. Momo is definitely surprised, but only has so much time to focus while under attack. Even as they turn the corrupted ones back to normal Serpo, another alien is standing on the ceiling, invisible to the naked eye. Worse, Momo's attacks don't do much to it as is, with her psychic powers unable to grab it. As always, Momo needs a good old-fashioned flashback to figure out what she needs to do. This time, she remembers Seiko telling her about the power hidden in names. Now, Momo channels her power, realizing that she needs to use a name to gain more power. Remembering how her co-workers, now Serpo Abominations, were telling her she wasn't putting enough love into the tea she made, Momo creates her signature move. As she makes a heart with her hands, a huge burst of energy emits forth the Momo Tribeam. It destroys the Serpo that were attacking them, but unfortunately, they've already done a number on the good Serpo, now referred to as Rokuro by Momo. She'll have to carry him out, desperately trying to get away, but unable to go back to Momo's house, as it's past 10 and Reiko Kashima will be waiting for them. Instead, Momo has the idea to rent a room in an all-night manga cafe, a safe place to sleep until it's safe to leave again. Except they can't, because Momo isn't 18, and that's the minimum requirement for an overnight room. In a minor. So they come up with the most awkward plan ever. In a classic play on the three kids stacked in a trench coat joke, Momo holds Serpo on her shoulders and hides him under a long coat. It's enough to fool the front desk, but once they get into the room, they have a whole other problem. Momo wants answers as to what's happening. Serpo doesn't know either though, saying that the aliens attacking them aren't one of the known 666 species of the galaxy. He mentions that they were after the ball, and it would likely be just the start of their invasion plans. Even more crazy, Serpo tells Momo about the various alien transportation sites on the Earth. From the pyramids in Egypt to the burial mounds in Japan, some places are natural 
gateways to another galaxy if they have enough power. Their time in the manga cafe isn't without incident. Reiko Kashimo knocks out the front desk worker, possessing his body and going to the door when he hears noises. In a tense moment, the worker comes into the room to check that there is only one person, suspecting that Momo is in there. They want her powers, and it's up to Serpo to play it cool while being interrogated. Except, he doesn't really have any kind of situational or human awareness, telling the guard it's okay to look up his skirt. Yeah, things get really really awkward, until Momo uses her powers to distract the guard, pushing the alien possessing him out. That just makes it even more awkward when he comes back to his senses though, pressed up against Serpo in the manga room. Now that they have some peace, Momo sleeps until morning, returning home after the sun finally comes up. Once there, she finds everyone in disrepair, with Gigi and Ira badly injured, while Okarun is in critical condition. Mr. Mantis Shrimp has been taking care of everyone since Seiko is out of town, performing rituals to thank the god who helped her with the first evil eye encounter. When Momo runs in to check on Okarun though, Vamola is standing over him in worry. Momo does not take kindly to her showing up, pushing her out of the room and screaming at her. This manages to wake Okarun up, who, despite being intubated and struggling to breathe, tells Momo to stop. He's already weak, and their screaming is just stressing him out more, hindering his recovery. He knows there's a major battle ahead, but they might not have the time to prepare. After they leave the room, Momo takes Vamala outside, telling her that she knows her secret. She screams at Vamala to leave, scaring her away from the house. The poor alien girl runs off crying, unable to explain herself to Momo due to the language barrier. Now, Sir Serpo warns them that they'll need all the help they can get to fight off the invasion. He's thrown out like trash, now stuck at Seiko's house with no legs and a missing arm. It's rough for him, but he doesn't have to worry about fighting in the upcoming battle with his injuries. Everyone starts to train, doing what they can to get stronger in preparation for battle whenever the aliens come back. Serpo mentions that it usually takes three days for the gateways to power up sufficiently, but that could be different now that they have the golden ball. Even with the impending threat though, Seiko and Turbo Granny aren't able to come back home due to the pact they made with that god, which requires them to pay tribute across its region. Oh, and Seiko broke her phone so they don't even have any way of contacting them. Typical. Danda then continues on with an epic training montage, with everyone preparing in their own way to fight off the encroaching alien threat. Okaran is still in critical condition, and Momo, even though he doesn't know it, confesses her love to him while he's under. Before they leave for the big battle days later, after a good meal to prepare them, Momo leaves a plate of curry beside Okarun's bed, just in case he wakes up. The note she includes with it is something everyone has been waiting to see since chapter 1, a simple love ya Momo. The series is primed to become Shonen Jump's next big thing, especially now that Jujutsu Kaisen and My Hero Academia are over. So for more Dan Dan, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell. We'll be bringing plenty of updates and theories as the series evolves, 